Welcome everybody, whether you're attending live at the moment or watching this on demand, it's my pleasure to be uh, presenting the new ISO standard for application management for the first time. It's a standard that's been developed for, um, for several years now and has been launched in July. So it's really, um, it's really something new and it's, it's great to be able to present this on the TopConf platform. TopConf is, um, is a conference organizing, organizer uh, where I've presented already live and this is the first webinar that we're doing so we're delighted to be, uh, to be doing that. So thanks for inviting me Chris. The event that I'll be presenting at uh, in, in person, live, is um, at the end of the month in Bucharest. It's going to be a great conference with plenty of speakers on, uh, on the topic of software um, development, software management. And I'm presenting two talks, two papers. One, the IT is from Flatland, business is from Spaceland presentation which is about the often troubled, troubled relationship with business and IT. And the second one is, uh, and I've been, been in the application management business for about uh, 20 or 30 years now, sharing my thoughts on application lifecycle management. So that's really diving into uh, a number of topics that we'll be, we'll be talking about in this webinar. Very much looking forward to that, uh, that conference. And there are other top conf conferences in Europe, so please take a look at the site. Great stuff there. Now, a short introduction of myself. I call myself the IT paradigmologist because I study IT paradigms. And an IT paradigm is really just a way of looking at our, our very interesting and very changeable IT world. It fascinates me how, how um, as our world changes, we, of course, we develop different perspectives. And I'm always on the lookout for new perspectives that give you better ins insight into what's going on. Now, how did I become an IT paradigmologist? You can see in, uh, in what I call my visual CV here that I started off in the late 70s as a programmer at 100% happiness. Then I got seduced into taking on management responsibilities, and you can see what happened to my uh, to my happiness. So I, after a couple of years, I uh, I changed that, changed that around, and focused on um, on the content because I'm a top I'm a content guy. So I um, I became a consultant, and I reinvented myself some years ago as the IT paradigmologist, and it's. Um, it's great to be able to help people discover where they are in their IT department and discover where they want to be, more importantly, and help them along that, that, uh, that way. So that's, that's what I do as my, in my role as an IT management consultant at my own company, Smalley.it. And alongside that uh, IT management work, I'm also affiliated with several organizations, you can see them here on the right hand side. The main one of which today is the not-for-profit ASL BSL Foundation. Um, and um, why is that relevant? Because the ASL BSL Foundation has two frameworks, ASL and BSL. And the ASL framework is very closely related to the new ISO standard. And we are very proud to be associated with the um, with having co-developed the ISO standard, but more about that later. The broad storyline of this webinar is, um, is in these, uh, these six steps. I'd like to set the scene by spending a little time talking about how IT is changing and how IT management or IT service management has to respond to that change. Then talk about the role of frameworks and standards as um, uh, a part of introducing some checks and balances to, um, to balance the growth that often occurs with, with 
technology, sometimes it sort of tends to get out of hand, and you need to uh, you need to step on the brake for a while to uh, slow it down, get it under control. And standards and frameworks help help there. Speaking about standards and frameworks, people often say we've implemented um, a fill in your favorite framework. But it's not not clear what people actually mean when they say we've implemented a framework. So I'd like to explore that a little bit. Another fuzzy statement is the term application management. Despite the fact that about 40% of IT budgets are spent on IT, IT management, oh sorry, are spent on application management, the term isn't really well defined. At least until now, because now we've got ISO 16350 that um, prescriptively, as a standard does, prescriptively um, defines what application management is and it makes it much easier to talk about we've implemented a framework or a standard because you, you've, got a, you've got a standard, a formal set of requirements which you can say uh, you know, we adhere, we conform to these, uh, to these uh, requirements. And finally, I just mentioned it, the ASL framework, the Application Services Library, uh, where the ISO standard provides prescriptive guidance and tells you what to do, what you should do. ASL provides descriptive guidance, uh, embellishes, gives you more background on application management, and it helps you improve your organization's application management activities, and it also helps you to conform to the ISO standard. So that's the uh, that's the agenda for the for the webinar. So moving on to the first um, the first topic: how IT has evolved. And here I've got a picture depicting the good old days when IT departments for were very self-contained, and where people who worked in IT uh, usually understood hardware, software, data, development, and operations. So they you know, really understood everything. But as technology, and this applies to all technologies, not only IT, as technology progressed, um, you, you find out that technology standardizes and specializes, specializes, and we found ourselves specialized into lots of silos. A silo for development, a silo for management, silos for applications, silos for infrastructure, and that, you know, it's a lot more complicated and of course the challenge is to connect these silos together. Now the next stage, and I think many of us, if you look at your organizations, you'd say we've possibly progressed beyond the complicated stage and we're in the complex stage in which we make use of information systems that we no longer own but we just use. So third party systems possibly provided on a uh, software as a service basis by other organizations. So this really, this is the, um, this is the stage of multidisciplinary collaboration in this picture with all, with lots of people with each with a piece of the jigsaw puzzle, depicts how multiple organizations need to work together collaboratively, closely collaboratively in order to, um, to produce the goods and give, give the business information systems and services which really fulfill their needs. Now some of you I'm sure looking at the terms simple, complicated and complex will be reminded of the uh, Kinefin framework. <coughs> <coughs> David Snowden's Kinefin framework. I don't have time to go into that now but I certainly like to encourage you to look up Kinefin framework on YouTube, you'll find an eight minute video which explains it very well. And there's an excellent uh, um, paper on the Kinefin framework on the Harvard Business Review site. So um, it's really, it's, it's one of the most fundamental things I've, I've come across. Very interesting stuff, the Kinefin framework. It gives you a better grip on uh, complex adaptive systems. Now, if we now think, we just spoke about how IT is involved, if we now think about how, how IT management or IT service management uh, is evolving to, to keep up with that change in IT, 
I think we could say that after a, after a period of initial development, uh, we ran into the situation where things had got out of control, and our first instinct was to sort of get them, get them, structure them, get them under control again, and we applied tools and processes in this first phase of, um, of the, what I call the evolution of IT service management to stabilize um, the conditions. Then as the world changed, the business world changed and certainly seemed to speed up an awful lot, IT need to, needed to speed up the, um, the rate of delivery of new software and we saw investment in uh, the agile approach and the DevOps movement, which is a fairly new movement, which is certainly not mainstream yet. Uh, but it, it is being adopted um, quite enthusiastically. So keep an eye on DevOps if you haven't heard of it before. It's a very interesting, very interesting development and helps you speed up the speed, helps you speed up delivery without compromising the quality of operations. Now the next phase in our evolution, and we've seen this for the past couple of years now, that people, IT people, are not no longer uh, completely investing in the, in the transactional side of IT, but also in the relation, re relational side. So developing the relationship between the IT function and their business partners in order to get a better understanding and manage expectations better. And that really is a major step in realizing more value from, from uh, IT investments. Now I think, and this is the, the, the fourth stage I like to, like to discuss here, I think once you've developed a decent relationship with your business partners, then if you see, and this is often the case, if you see that they're struggling with their responsibility to define the kind of information systems and services that they need, I call that demand, and if they're also struggling once they get the systems and services, if they're also struggling with getting value out of their investments by using the systems well, then I think it's, it's time to help the business develop those capabilities, and that's what I call business information management. Those two last two topics business relationship management, business information management. Really fascinating stuff, and maybe Chris, we could do that, um, do that webinar another time. Anyway, and of course, after, after this, there'll be more development. But I think these are interesting things that are going on at the moment. It gives you a decent perspective of what's, um, what, what's happening in the IT service management space. Now, what I'd like to do now is uh, take a look at standards and frameworks and go back to the, um, to the mid-80s, travel back in time to the mid-80s when organizations were starting to realize that their rapidly growing EDP, electronic data processing departments, who remembers the term EDP? When their rapidly growing electronic data process, processing departments needed more structure to keep up with the developer's creativity in, from producing unmanageable systems because developers are very creative and you, you, know, you can't let that go, get on with control. Um, the British government in the mid-80s took the lead and commissioned the development of codes of practice, as they called them at the time, for managing IT infrastructures. This was initially known as the GITTIM, that's the Government IT Infrastructure Management Method which uh, ended up as what we now call ITIL. One of the countries, first countries where ITIL was widely adopted was the Netherlands. And that's where I'm based, by the way, and our ASL BSL Foundation. In the 90s, the Dutch Computer Center, National Computer Center, recognized that while a formal way of managing IT infrastructures was emerging, that's the ITIL methodology, Support and maintenance of applications was really an amorphous mess of firefighters and their personal practices. And inspired by the efforts of their infrastructure colleagues, 
the Dutch National Computer Center launched the R2C process model for application management. And that, uh, that model on the right hand side in grey and in Dutch, I hope you can read Dutch, that is the initial R2C process model. Now, just as the GITTIM uh, changed into ITIL, the R2C model morphed into ASL, the Application Services Library. And the ASL uh, model developed the initial R2C's future-oriented lifecycle management, which you can just see at the top of that uh, little diagram, into a cluster of processes that determine the future of the portfolio of the applications. Uh, ASL also added to this R2C model a cluster of processes that determine the future of the application management department. So thinking about what kind of changes do you need to make to make, may have to make to uh, application management departments in order to keep up with ever-changing circumstances. Now this, this action replay that I just talked you, talked you through, that takes us up to about uh, 2007. And by that time, many organizations in the Netherlands were using ASL and encouraged by this adoption, the Dutch standards organization MEN launched a national standard for application management. And that was called the MEN 3434. And that was strongly based on, on ASL. And in 2011, so a couple of years ago now, ISO, the International Standards Organization, decided to develop an international standard for application management. And now the ISO 16350 uh, standard, uh, published in, in July, clearly inspired, as I'll show you later on in the webinar, by ASL, and although some of the process names differ, the structure is, is pretty much the same. So now we have an ISO standard that describes the outcomes, activities, and tasks of the whole application management domain. And what's particularly interesting, I think, is that if you think about DevOps, uh, you can see, before we started to talk about DevOps, you can see the dev part and the ops part reflected in this R2C model, which was formulated in the, in the mid-90s. So even then, we recognize the need to, uh, to have these two areas very closely connected. So that was, that was just a blast from the past, going back to the 80s and taking us up to, uh, taking us up to, um, to today. Now, I... As you recall, I call myself the IT paradigmologist, and this is one of my favorite IT paradigms, which I find particularly useful to um, explain IT things. And I'll just talk you through this, uh, this diagram briefly. On the left-hand side, in blue, you'll see the business organization, the user organization, and embedded in the user organization, there is the BIM function. And BIM stands for Business Information Management. And those are the responsibilities of the user organization with respect to, uh, to information and related technology. On the right-hand side, in green, you see the IT organization. And that could be an internal IT department complemented by external IT providers. And I've divided it up very simplistically in an application management uh, part and an IT service management part. You could also say application development, application management, but for, simpli for simplicity's sake, I've just called it application management. And down the bottom in gray, there's the information system itself, which comprises hardware, software, data. Now, between these three entities, you see three relationships, demand, supply, and use. And um, demand is what the business wants from IT. Supply is what the IT uh, does in order to provide information systems and services that the business needs. And the final part, use, which is often, often neglected, 
is when the business actually makes use of the information systems and services and in so doing gets value out of them. If you look at all these all of these three um, uh, these three entities and three relationships, you can say that uh, as in the title here, application management is part of IT supply and collaborates closely with demand and use of IT. And of course, with the uh, the IT infrastructure, in, infrastructure uh, IT service management function. Let's bring standards and frameworks into this picture. Uh, in a couple of minutes' time, we're going to be moving on and talking about the ISO standard of the ASL framework, and they support application management. And there are also standards that, um, um, for instance, the uh, 25. Um, uh, 10 standard, which uh, defines quality characteristics for software. So these are the kind of characteristics to which applications should, uh, should conform. Then we have standards for IT service management, such as the ISO 20000 standard. A very interesting new development, the IT for IT uh, approach. So that's part of the open group. You'll find that easily enough if you Google IT for IT and the ITIL framework. Now, in, in addition to that, we have overarching standards between the business and IT, such as ISO 38500 and COBIT for governments of IT, TOGAF, which again is part of the, uh, the open group like the IT for IT um, framework, TOGAF for architecture, and the BRM book, the BRM body of knowledge for business relationship management, which connects those two domains, business and IT. And then finally, in the summary of, of standards and frameworks, uh, our ASL BSL Foundation's uh, other standard, the Business Information Services Library. And uh, as an added bonus to this presentation, I'd like to give you a quick overview of BSL. It's what I call the business's guide to IT. It helps them make the right IT investments and assures that they get value out of, out of those investments. Now, as service consumers, not service providers, but as service consumers, business people are responsible for identifying what kind of investments to make in information and technology. They're responsible for delegating the techie stuff to the IT department. Then when they get the systems that they that they've asked for, they're responsible for ensuring that, new, that the users use the information systems well and actually get value out of them. And our BSL framework supports this with a process model and best practices that describe everything from answering non-technical questions from end users to agreeing services and service levels with the IT department, up until defining a portfolio, a portfolio of strategic investments in information systems. And this gives guidance to business roles such as business process owners and system owners, business analysts and information managers and super users, all on the blue side of this diagram. And it helps the business improve their return on investments in information and technology. It also helps them interact more effectively with IT people. That's often a difficult topic, talking to uh, the, you know, the communication between business and IT is often quite, uh, quite difficult. And from a governance perspective, and I think this is very important, BSL helps the business demonstrate that they're managing information and technology as a valuable uh, business asset. So that's a quick overview of the BSL framework and our, our publisher, Van Haren Publishing, has kindly offered a free download of the pocket guide, the BSL pocket guide, which you can find on that, uh, that link there. So please take advantage of that. Back to the storyline. Um, you often hear people saying, we've implemented framework uh, XYZ. But what do they actually mean by that? 
have they bought a publication? Have they read the publication? Have they actually understood what, uh, what was meant? Uh, have they taken it a step further, followed the training, possibly even achieved certification? In other words, acquired a certain amount of knowledge? Are they talking the talk? Are they using the new terminology that they've learned to describe their old way of working so that possibly it improves the communi communication but doesn't improve the substantive way of working? Or the next phase, do they mean when they say we've implemented our framework that we've changed a uh, part of our formal way of working using either the whole framework or part of the framework. Now that's fine, they've, then they've just changed the formal way of working, but have people actually changed their behavior? Are they doing things differently? Because there's an awful lot of difference between changing a formal way of working, or written up in a quality management system, or a, or a manual, and the difference between pixel people actually working differently. And the final step that people possibly mean when they say we've implemented framework XYZ is that they're achieving better results because of course that's, that's what it's all about. You don't implement a framework for the sake of implementing a framework. You implement it because you want to change something in real life. So let's just take a quick look at what do we actually want to achieve. From a business point of view, I'd say if I'm a business executive, I want to make the right investment choices in information and technology. I want to delegate it effectively to the IT department or to an external service provider. I want to ensure that my information systems are well used by the users so I'm getting the value out of them. I also want to make sure that my information systems are being protected from abuse. So I'm not getting hacked or anything like that. And possibly my governing body uh, insists that I demonstrate that I'm managing these valuable business assets, information and technology, in which I've invested a lot of money. So can I demonstrate that I'm managing information and technology properly? So these are these are business results that I think we should be uh, we should be uh, be aware of. From an IT perspective, you know, when it's delegated to IT, then you want to do the, the IT stuff good, cheap, and fast. And of course, you've got to uh, you've got to reach a balance the balance in that. And in addition to that, you also may have some governance requirements. So you're required to demonstrate that it's under control. And this is where frameworks and standards come into play. Because if you can say we conform to a certain standard, then you can demonstrate that you're actually you're actually doing the stuff well. So that's uh, that's a bit about uh, the kind of results you want to achieve. And here, this if you look at that um, that Venn diagram on the left hand side, on the right hand side, you can see the influence of um, external standards and frameworks that they can influence your formal way of working or part of your formal way of working, and your formal way of working influences how people actually work. And the, uh, the strategy that I'm, I'm seeing increasingly is that people no longer rely on one single framework, but they adopt parts of multiple frameworks, multiple bodies of knowledge, in order to address specific issues. For instance, if you've got a problem um, that your costs are out of control, you'll be looking in particular to frameworks and standards that have guidance in that particular area. Take your governance, then you'd be wise to look at the ISO 38500 standard and the COVID framework, because they're really specialized in those, in those areas. Now, you can adopt various standards, but you really have to adapt the guidance into a way of working that suits your systems and your organization, because it depends an awful lot on the kind of systems that you have and the kind of organization and organizational culture that you have, uh, how you actually um, 
set up the way that you manage systems. If you're a very bureaucratic kind of organization, then the way of doing IT would probably reflect that. So the way you adapt standards and frameworks has to reflect the kind of organization that you are. Uh, back to the storyline, the, the topic of application management used to be um, just as fuzzy as, um, as that term implemented. Uh, there was confusion between what is application management, what's application development, um, what's the difference between application management and application lifecycle management, application portfolio management, when the changes stop, when the projects start, what's the difference between maintenance and enhancements all things which needed some kind of clarification. Now, I, I used to use the, um, the five bullets on the, on the second part of the sheet as my definition of application management, that it ensures the availability and performance of applications, an operational aspect. Application management responds to incidents, queries, service requests, and change requests from the users and others. Application management actually executes changes in projects in order to keep the functionality up to date and also improve the technical behavior of applications, like such as improving the performance. Application management reports on the conformance to the service levels that have been agreed. And finally, application management fulfills an extremely important role in advising, in advising the kind of application strategy discussing that and agreeing that with the business, the kind of strategy that will get, get the best return on, uh, on investments. Anyway, that was, that was my definition, definition of, uh, of application management, but now we have a formal ISO standard. And uh, I'll be sharing that, uh, that standard with you, that definition with you um, in a couple of minutes' time. And, but I'd just like to talk you through the first the highlights of the standard. It's um, it's a framework for application management uh, with terminology which appeals to the whole software industry, whether you're an internal IT department or an external service provider. But they've done, done something very clever by relating the standard to other relevant standards, recognizing that there's some overlap between standards and not creating a standard in splendid isolation. So you can see relationships with these other standards. It applies to the supply, maintenance, and renewal of applications, whether an internal IT department does that or an external service provider it doesn't make, make any difference. But for external service providers, I think the, the ISO standard offers a an opportunity for competitive advantage because if you as an external service provider in the application management domain can say that your ISO, you conform to an ISO standard that may give your customers or your potential customers a lot more confidence in your capabilities compared to a competitor who can't make that claim. For internal IT departments, ISO standards in general can be used to um, achieve some focus on internal process improvement initiatives by uh, setting a goal to conform to a certain standard that really sort of focuses and channels the energy to improve the way you do application management. So that's another reason to adopt um, and adapt uh, the ISO standard if you're an internal service department, an internal IT department. As I mentioned previously, the standard has been informed by the, by the ASL standard. I'm very proud that we've been, uh, been part of this, uh, this development. This is the, um, the contents of the, uh, the standard. It's, it's about 85 pages long. Um, I'll be spending a little time um, diving into the, the four topics that I've underlined here, the scope, the conformance aspects, some terms and definitions, and application management processes that are covered, giving you a, a feel of what are they, what's the, what, what's the scope of the, uh, the standard. 
most of the standard, I'd say about two thirds, if not more, is spent on the um, on the application management processes themselves, the outcomes and activities and tasks related to application management. Looking at the scope, and this diagram down the bottom is quite illustrative. It illustrates that application management as defined by, by ISO does not refer to the initial application development, but to the stage of operation and use, in which it closely, closely collaborates with the business information management function that I mentioned previously in that paradigm of mine, and with the IT infrastructure management function, which I called in uh, IT service management, but that's a pre pretty similar, pretty similar concept. So this is this is how it um, how we position application management in the ISO standard, focusing on everything that happens after the initial development. And that takes up about 40% of all IT budgets, application management. So from an economic point of view, this is really a significant area. I promised you a definition of application management according to ISO, and it's, it's this one. It's the domain responsible for all of the tasks and activities that are aimed at managing, supporting, maintaining, and renewing existing applications and related data structures. And you can, hear, you can see here the focus on existing applications rather than new applications. And applications and data structures being the two main objects which are actually supported, maintained, renewed and managed. And an important note uh, to observe that application management um, its focus is not just on the application itself, but looking uh, through the application that it supports to the business process. As long as the business process that the application supports um, is an active process in the organization, that should be the focus of application management. So it's all about supporting a business process with a particular application, um, but if that application has to be replaced by another one, that is in order to, to continue the support to the business process, that is also part of application management. So it really takes the broader, the broader business process perspective. Very important note there to observe. Now, in addition to this uh, definition, there are 33 other definitions which I've listed here I've color-coded them. You can see that most of them are, are red. The dark red applies to terms which are um, the objects, such as a functional system design, the IT infrastructure, a software product. And the, the light red, um, those are characteristics of the objects, of the, the, of the IT objects, like um, availability or reliability of an application or infrastructure. The three blue, light blue ones refer to the three um, IT management activity domains that I mentioned previously, application management, business information management, and IT infrastructure management. And that the purple ones refer to uh, the organizational um, definitions that are used, the uh, application management organization, the supplier, the customer, of course, the business, and the organizational chain in which the customer resides, because businesses often, uh, often reside in a whole ecosystem of other organizations. Take the healthcare chain, for instance, in which um, general practitioners um, uh, play a role and hospitals and governing bodies. So you've got a whole e chain of, of organizations that exchange information and that's an important concept in application management. Looking at the processes, 26 processes um, cover the whole scope 
of application management, and each process comprises a statement about the purpose of the process, the outcomes you can expect from the process, and the activities and tasks which you have to execute in order to achieve the outcomes. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, some of the tasks are shared with other standards. Now, this diagram is a bit difficult to read, so I've, um, I've made a different depiction of it, just giving you the, the broad areas here. And you can see the three levels at the bottom of the operational level, management level in the middle, and the strategic level up top. At bottom left, you can see a cluster of processes related to supporting applications, supporting the daily use of applications, whereas on the right-hand side, there's a cluster of processes uh, which, are, which address maintaining and renewing the application, in other words, changing the functionality or changing the technical behavior of the application, and in the middle, there are connecting processes which connect these two important areas, bottom left and bottom right, and what we often refer to as dev and ops. They've got to be closely connected and balanced together because they are conflicting, conflicting um, uh, characteristics of these, uh, these process clusters. Um, application support focuses more on keeping systems up and running whereas application maintenance and renewal focuses on change, and obviously you've got to balance those too. The management processes manage time, money, resources, quality, whether it's external quality, such as the service levels you agree with the business, or the internal quality, it addresses both of those quality aspects. And at the top level, and I'll, uh, I'll open that up to show you the content of the, uh, the actual processes in these clusters. On the top level, top right, you can see processes related to the application strategy area in which you can see analyses of things that are happening in the environment of the applications in the business itself, in the uh, ecosystem in which the business uh, acts and developments in, along, on, in, the, on the, in technology itself. And looking at developments in these areas, how technology is changing, how the business is changing, and how the environment of the business in cha is changing, these all have impact on the applications. And you could look at that from two perspectives from the perspective of individual applications, which we call the application lifecycle perspective, what are we going to do with this particular application? But you can also look at applications um, as part of a whole, in other words, take a portfolio view of all of the applications and see which are the most important ones and which are the ones that you should possibly be investing um, less in. Uh, finally, the top left, uh, the area which is um, the application management organization strategy, in other words, thinking about the future of the application management function, the application management department, in what kind of technology sh should they be investing, in what kind of skills should they be investing, what should they, they be doing themselves, what should they be outsourcing. And, of course, what are the needs of their customers, which is reflected in the process account market definition. So this is really about making a, making a business plan, uh, an annual business plan for the, uh, the application management department. So this should give you an idea of the, the processes, the 26 processes in the ISO standard. Now, as far as conformance is concerned, you have, you have three options. If you want to say, we conform to this ISO standard, you can choose between full conformance and tailored conformance. And full conformance, you can, there are two options there. You can say, we conform to uh, the outcomes as specified in the, in the standard. 
for a declared set of processes. So you say these processes are applicable to our organization and for these processes we have full conformance to the outcomes as specified by ISO. Or you can say we conform to the tasks. Uh, two options and it depends on your it depends on your organization which you uh, which you prefer to uh, to conform to. Another option is that you you take the standard and you say, yeah, this is great as a starting point, but our organization has specific characteristics uh, which aren't reflected in the standard. And you can tailor the standard to reflect your own organization and then uh, conform to those standards. So you have the choice between conforming to a standard standard or to a tailored standard. And there's more about that, of course, in the, in the standard itself. So lots of possibilities for conformance. Finally, before I move on to the ASL framework, um, the, to give you an idea of the kind of the content of, um, of the standard, if you're talking about conformance, you want to demonstrate that you, that you conform to the standard, or you want to use the standard to check whether you're doing the right kind of things, these are examples of outcomes and activities and tasks in the standard. I've taken the process software design and taken the first two outcomes. I won't bother to read them because you can, you can read them for yourself here. But these are the kind of, just to give you an impression, these are the kind of outcomes that you'll find in the, in the standard. And looking at the activities, the elaboration of the request, that's an activity. And within the activity, that's broken down into a number of tasks. And if you, uh, if you uh, want to conform to the standard, you have to conform to those tasks. So this is the, the kind of level and content of the, the things to which, the requirements to which you would have to conform. So with that, moving on to the final, uh, fairly short part of the webinar, the ASL framework, which complements the ISO prescriptive standard by giving descriptive guidance that helps you improve how you do application management and it helps you conform to the standard if you want to want to do that. Now I've put up that um, that ISO process diagram on the left hand side here and compared it to the, the ASL process model on the right hand side and you can see apart from the way it's uh, depicted in, in, in circles and, and rectangles, you can see the similarity in the structure. There's, there are some changes in the, in the names of the processes, but the content is, uh, is very much the same. So very similar as far as that's concerned. ASL is a process model for application management, and it's complemented with a broad collection of best practices examples of how people have used the framework. We also have lots of guidance about how to implement the framework, how to improve the way you do application management. And this is backed up by, uh, by a, an independent foundation level training, typically a two-day training, and an independent multiple choice exam performed by APMG International. The framework's owned by a not-for-profit organization, the ASL BSL Foundation. Lots of our stuff is, uh, is, is free, um, freely available on the website, lots of publications and presentations, so please take a look, a look at the website. The kind of benefits you could get out of the ASL framework is um, because it gives you a, a professional improvement approach you can really communicate if you want to improve your application management. It really is a statement of intent that you're taking application management seriously. We've noticed that people have often used ASL to improve the image of application management. 
with it because it often has a, a sort of a neglected kind of feel to it and people don't take it seriously whereas as I mentioned before it does it does represent a serious economic part of uh, significant investment in IT 40 percent of IT IT costs and application management helps you improve your services Helps, helps you improve the manageability of activities, including getting better insight into the costs and benefits of application management. So those are the kind of benefits that you could get out of, uh, out of ASL. You can see here the, the similarities and differences in the scope of, of I, I, the, the standard and ASL. The first three topics, slightly different names, but the similar kind of content where the ISO standard dives into the outcomes and activities and in particular tasks in much more depth and much more rigor than the ASL framework, whereas ASL uh, gives much more background information um, on how application management is run and gives you much more guidance and examples of examples to help you actually improve your activities so that um, not only you improve the activities but you can also demonstrate that you conform to the conform to the standard now this this is the this is the full framework uh, just leaving this here for your um, further reference you can download a PDF of our presentation uh, at the end of the webinar so you'll be able to find that and if by any chance you can't find the PDF, please feel free to get in touch with me. I'll be leaving my contact details at the end of the webinar in about three minutes' time. This is uh, freely available on the, uh, on the ASL DSL Foundation website. We're very proud to say that the framework is available in, in many languages, thanks to our worldwide ambassadors who've done lots of work in translating the framework and in particular our Polish ambassador has made a great series of mind maps not only for ASL and BSL but for, but for other frameworks and standards so I'd encourage you to take a look at those they're a great study guide whether it's ASL or BSL or other frameworks they're really a great, uh, great resource to have in your, in your collection so with that, uh, back to the storyline to, um, to finish it off, I spoke about how IT is changing, how we now live in a, in a complex, complex uh, world of IT and how IT management needs to change to reflect that. That frameworks and standards, standards are really useful to, as, a ch as checks and balances to keep growth under control. We've clarified the term we've implemented a framework, we've clarified thanks to the, the ISO stand the term application management and hopefully given you some insight into the, the standard. Um, you can find it on the ISO.org website where you can also find a free preview of the standard, not the whole standard but something that will certainly whet your appetite and hopefully encourage you to purchase the standard. And I also gave you some uh, uh, an overview of the not only the ASL framework but how it um, how it compares with with the ISO standard and really how you can use these two in combination with each other to improve your uh, your application mentioned activities and get them up to a really, really top class uh, top class level. So with that. I'd like to invite Chris to join us just to round off the webinar. Thank you very much, Mark. And Chris, I can, at the moment I can't see whether we have any questions. Um, if, if we do, we can answer them, and if, if not, uh, I'd invite anybody who would like to ask any questions, either people who have attended the webinar live or people who are watching it online. Here are my contact details. Delighted to uh, to develop the dialogue with you uh, personally. So feel free to get in touch. 
Well, Chris, up to you, I think, to, uh, to round it off for today. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Mark. Very interesting uh, webinar. Thank you for introducing the ISO 16350 to us today. Um, this entire webinar will be online on YouTube and linked on our TopConf website as well, of course, and social medias. So you will have plenty of possibilities to see this all this uh, webinar again online. Mark, thank you very much. We will meet each other in two to in three weeks in Bucharest. Looking forward to see more details of your ISO certification there. And of course, looking forward to meet you again. Yeah, me too. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Bye now. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.